general sense here, we'll start talking about uh, the behaviour and design of bridges in particular. We've already been through this slide a couple of times uh, and the important aspect now is we are looking at how do we go from whatever this structure is to this equivalent single degree of freedom system. The procedure is exactly the same whether we're talking about a bridge or a building uh, and most of the equations are, are identical. As far as everything else is concerned, the procedure makes no difference between uh, a building or a bridge. We still use an effective stiffness model. We use the appropriate relationship between equivalent viscous damping and ductility and the same response spectra, of course. So the procedure, as we've mentioned several times, is to determine what the design displacement is and therefore calculate the effective stiffness and having determined that, the required strength. And just I'd like to emphasize that there is an additional difference between displacement-based design and force-based design that we haven't mentioned yet but I'll get into further down the line. And that is that in force-based design, we calculate the strength using nominal properties at this point in displacement-based design, we calculate the strength at this point. And you'll notice that there is a difference for well-designed structures as a consequence of the strain hardening section of the response. We've gone through this sufficient, so I don't think I need to, to mention it again. So how do we go about this procedure when we're talking about multi-degree of freedom systems? And this slide illustrates the steps that are involved. The procedure is a single degree of freedom design method based on the fundamental inelastic mode of response. And with multi-degree of freedom systems, the first aspect that we need to do is to determine the displaced shape of the structure. And from this displaced shape and the distribution of mass, we can determine what the characteristic displacement is. That characteristic displacement is a displacement we can use with an equivalent single degree of freedom system. We also need to determine the effective mass. That effective mass is the mass that's associated with the inelastic mode of response. So it's not the total mass of the building or bridge. We determine the effective ductility and damping, the effective stiffness and the base shear in the normal fashion for a single degree of freedom system, and then, having got that base shear, we then have to go again back to our relationship between our multi-degree of freedom system and the single degree of freedom system. The first thing is to distribute that mass, that, that base shear, to the mass locations, and then to analyze the structure to determine the moments at the plastic hinges. Now, for bridges, that's comparatively straightforward, but we'll show that in buildings, the appropriate way to do that analysis is not by stiffness characteristics, but by equilibrium characteristics. So tomorrow we'll talk quite a lot about that. Having done that, having determined what the moments at the plastic hinges need to be and, and designed the, the plastic hinges, we then use capacity design to determine the forces elsewhere. The first thing then is to determine the characteristic design displacement. That is the value that we will use in the equivalent single degree of freedom system. And to do that, we have to have a knowledge of the inelastic mode shape, which we've shown here is this 
symbol here. The I just referred to the various degrees of freedom, the number of degrees of freedom we have of the structure. In a building, perhaps the number of stories. In the bridge, perhaps the number of piers and the abutments. So we need to have some idea as to what that displaced shape looks like, not numerically, but as a fundamental mode shape, a dimensionless mode shape. We then try to determine what is the critical, what is likely to be the critical aspect of the design in terms of the member. For example, well, we'll come back to that, but it could be the critical floor or the, the, the floor level of a building, or it could be the critical uh, column of a bridge. And we determine what the displacement of that particular element or floor is at the performance limit state, whether it's serviceability or uh, damage control and so forth. If we can determine what that numeric value is, then we can just scale up the inelastic mode shape to determine what the displacements are at all levels, the design displacements are at all levels of the building or all parts of the bridge itself. It's just taking the inelastic mode shape and scaling it up so that the displacement of the critical element equals the calculated value for the performance limit state. Having done that, we can then determine the generalized displacement coordinate, or the characteristic displacement as we generally call it, of that first mode using the simple expression here. It's the, the sum of the mass times the displacement squared divided by the sum of the mass times the displacements. A very simple expression, which is uh, common in any uh, dynamic analysis uh, textbook. The only difference being that this is an inelastic mode shape, not an elastic mode shape. So we're, that critical displacement, we had to calculate that uh, value of that critical displacement or floor. When we're talking about frames, it's normally governed by the structural or non-structural drift in beams of the lowest story itself. In cantilever wall buildings, it's normally governed by the plastic rotation at the wall base for long walls, or perhaps the drift in the top story. So it's a difference between the two of those. Bridges, the critical displacement is normally governed by plastic rotation, or occasionally the drift limit of the shortest column. So it, it's, un, it, it's unusual, it's quite rare to specify drift limits for buildings, because for bridges, sorry, because this is not terribly significant. So for frames, what we see is that on the basis of large numbers of inelastic time history analysis uh, carried out by overworked graduate students, uh, particularly in Italy and New Zealand and the United States, it's been established that in fact the dimensionless mode shape is rather simple for typical regular buildings. If the structure is less than four stories high or four stories or less high, we can use a linear mode shape and that's perfectly adequate. If we're talking about structures that are taller than four stories high or frames that are taller than four stories high, it's of this parabolic shape here, which is governed by this dimensionless expression here. In this, HI is the height of level I and HN is the height of the top story itself. So it's a rather simple expression. In some cases, particularly when the structure is, um, is very irregular, it may be necessary to review this assumption of the mode shape at the end of the design and uh, recalculate it and do an iteration. Generally, that won't be necessary. Cantilever wall design profiles we can find more directly in that we know that it's the sum of the elastic deformation and the plastic deformation. And I'm not going to go into this in any detail now because we'll talk about it tomorrow morning in the second session. But again, it's related to the yield curvature and the heights of the individual elements. So this is the elastic displacement profile. And this here is the plastic displacement profile, which is found from the uh, plastic curvature for the particular limit state minus the elastic curvature times the plastic hinge length times the, the height of the particular floor. So we can determine this directly. We don't have to estimate what the, the mode shape would be like. When we come to bridges, uh, it gets more complex. In the longitudinal direction, 
generally there's no problem because uh, the displacements of all parts of the bridge in the longitudinal direction are likely to be equal, unless it's a very long bridge, perhaps with movement joints, and perhaps where the elastic flexibility of the superstructure becomes significant. But normally that won't be the case, whether it's an, a regular structure or an irregular structure. However, when it's uh, looking at the transverse direction, we have more problems. And rather than look at these two diagrams on the bottom, we'll go straight to this slide here, which shows some of the possibilities for the mode shapes. In the first little cartoon here, we have a system where the, all of the abutments, the two abutments are free to displace, and the superstructure is very rigid in comparison with the uh, piers, and the structure is symmetrical. So this is an ideal situation which very rarely actually exists. But in that case, the lateral displacements of all the piers are the same. If we now go to this one here, again, free abutments, uh, a very stiff superstructure, but something where the piers are, have different heights, then we may get some rotation associated with the, the structural shape. So there will be lateral displacement and torsional rotation. The more common case is where, uh, if we have a multi-degree of freedom bridge, where we have a flexible uh, superstructure and free abutments, then the displaced shape, the mode shape, might take something like this sort of shape into account. Or if it is restrained at the abutments, then perhaps this shape. And notice here that we have some displacement at the abutments because the abutment structure will never be rigid. Um, if we have a movement joint in the structure at some location, then clearly that's going to influence the transverse mode shape. So we have to take that into account as well. In this case, the superstructure is considered to be rigid. In this case over here, it has flexibility. So there are a large number of different potential shapes that we have to take into account. And it's a matter of some judgment and experience and perhaps iteration to get the shape right. And we'll go through that later on uh, in, the, in the design. However, something that I'll mention now, but I'll mention again later, if we have the common situation of uh, a bridge that is restrained at the abutments, but has flexibility transversely and longitudinally, then the longitudinal response will always govern. And the longitudinal response is easy to do for the design. So we can say, all right, we can forget about the transverse response, which is more difficult to do. The second point, okay, so we've now established more or less how we calculate the, the procedure, at least for calculating the characteristic displacement of the equivalent single degree of freedom model. The next thing we need is the mass. How much mass is associated with that mode itself? And this is just the same as would be done, if you like, in a modal analysis. You associate a certain percentage of the mass with each mode. We are only interested in the first mode, not in the higher modes. And the reason for this is the capacity design approach that we use will take care of those higher modes. Particularly tomorrow, uh, when we talk about frames and wall buildings, we'll show how this is done in a more important fashion that is necessary for bridges. Anyway, if we know what the uh, displacements of the individual uh, elements of the structure are and what the associated masses are, this in a multi-story building would be the, at the floor levels, and we've calculated what the design displacement is, then we can use this expression to calculate what the effective mass is. And that's typically 70 to 80% of the total mass for buildings. And for bridges, it's typically more like 90%. Now, you'll all be familiar with modal analysis uh, where you say you have to consider at least as not, uh, much mass to, to represent 90% of the total mass of the structure. That's nonsense. You don't need to do that if you have a capacity design approach. Uh, which compensates and accurately uh, considers those aspects. And the second point is that the modal analysis approach using those large number of different modes doesn't give you the right answer anyway because you're artificially reducing the response of the higher modes 
by the ductility factor or the force reduction factor, which should not be done. I'll talk about that more when we talk about uh, wall structures tomorrow. All right, the equivalent viscous stamping. For buildings, what we need to do first of all is to determine what the height of our equivalent single degree of freedom system is. And again, this is rather simple to determine. The effective height is given by this expression, the sum of mass times displacement times height divided by the sum of mass times displacement. So typically this is about three quarters of the, the height of the building. For frames, the yield displacement then is just found as the yield, uh, the yield rotation, which we uh, have expressions for, which you've seen a couple of times today already, times this effective height. So we're assuming there a linear yield displacement profile, which is rough, but not too rough. Uh, it will mean small errors in the ductility uh, calculation, but as Michele has already indicated to you, small errors in that ductility calculation don't result in large errors in the structural design forces. And uh, for walls, we can calculate the uh, effective height uh, using the yield expression, just putting the effective height into it, so straightforward. If we can do that, then we can calculate the displacement ductility, because for these buildings we know what the yield displacement is, we've already calculated what the characteristic displacement is, so we know what the ductility demand for that particular limit state is in our equivalent single degree of freedom system. And notice that at no stage here has strength come into the calculations. This is independent of the strength that is put into the uh, thing. We would still have the same value whether it had a base shear capacity of 5% or a base shear capacity of 20%, provided the geometry of the structure remained at the same. That is, where the beams and columns are and the depths and the section sizes of the, the elements itself. Now you've already seen this value from Michele, which talks about the, the different equivalent viscous damping here. So if we've calculated the ductility, we can calculate the damping of this equivalent single degree of feedum system, dependent on what type of structural element. Sorry, this slide is not in your handout at this point. You've seen it before somewhere, but I'm gonna throw it in once or twice, again, in this element here. So this is the equivalent uh, viscous damping for bridges and wall buildings. They're essentially the same. Frame buildings in reinforced concrete, steel frame buildings, almost identical. You might be surprised to see that the, a steel building, which dissipates so much more energy than a concrete building, actually doesn't come up with a greater value for the equivalent viscous damping. And the reason for that is that the, the, uh, the shape of the hysteresis curve for, uh, for steel frame buildings tends to be rather similar to a um, elastoplastic characteristic, and that is very sensitive to P delta effects. We tend to get crawling of the displacement. So under an earthquake response, it tends to move off in one direction, and as a consequence, the, the damping is not so good. And then we have all these other systems as well. The equivalent viscous stampings, we could calculate it by different procedures. I've mentioned so far saying, let's do it by calculating the equivalent single degree of freedom structure, calculating the yield displacement at that characteristic height, calculating the design displacement at that characteristic height, and therefore calculating the structural ductility capacity as one value. In some cases, it may be better to do it story by story or even element by element. Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback from the, the a lot of echo. Is, is, is it okay for you people? Yep, okay. Um, for buildings then, we can do it uh, on a story by story basis, which uh, weights the, uh, it takes the individual damping of each story, weights it by the shear force and the displacement of each story. And, it's a more complex way, but there are examples shown in the textbook to, to use this approach. How about, though, when we get to something like this, a wall building itself? We, we showed a slide earlier on of this particular structure saying that if we look at the response of this building, we know that the yield curvature of this wall here is going to be much less than this wall here 
because it's proportional to the yield strain of the flexural reinforcement divided by the length of the wall. So let's say that this uh, wall B is twice as long as wall C, then what it tells us is that the yield displacement of walls A and C is going to be twice as much as wall B, no matter what we assume for the strength of these elements. We can't do anything about it. In force-based design, it's imagined that somehow by reducing the strength of these shorter walls here, or less long walls, that we will actually have the same yield displacement. It's impossible to achieve. So since we know that, provided these floor slabs are rigid diaphragms in plane, we know that the maximum response displacement of the two is going to be the same. If the displacement, the design displacement is the same, and it will be governed by this particular wall probably, then if that's the case, then we see that walls A and C have a ductility demand which is half of that for this element here. So if we have different ductility demands, which will be the same case in a real, uh, in a force-based design, how, we, how do we deal with that in displacement-based design? We've said that in force-based design, we don't deal with it. We just push it to the side and forget about it. But in displacement-based design, we can make a rational consideration of this. We say that the system damping is found by the sum of the shears of the different lateral force-resisting elements, walls in this case, times their damping, divided by the sum of the shears. OK, to do that, we need to know how much shear is taken by this wall and how much shear is taken by that wall. And of course, we don't know this because this is the start of the design process. So what do we do about that? Well, the first thing that we do is to start using intelligent design. That means design based on experience. And we say, if we did a, a force-based design of this, we would rather stupidly allocate a much higher reinforcement ratio to this wall than this. In fact, it would come up as being proportional to the wall length. So this one would have a reinforcement ratio that was twice as much as this one. But, and that would mean then that we'd have much bigger spacing of longitudinal reinforcement here than in that. But in displacement-based design, we would say, what's a rational way to design this? Well, a rational way for simplicity of construction and so forth would be to say, we'll have the same reinforcement ratio for all of these walls here, for this wall and for this wall. Let's say we'd put in half a percent of flexural reinforcement in each of those. We can make this decision. There's absolutely no reason why we can't do this at the start of the design process. And the value of that is that if we make that decision, or any other decision that we wish to make about the relative reinforcement ratios, then we know what the relative strengths of these walls is, how much the moment capacity is. It'll be proportional to the square of the wall lengths. So if the moment capacity is proportional to the square of the wall lengths, then the shear carried by these is proportional to the square of the wall lengths, not proportional to the cube of the wall length, as would be the case in force-based design. OK, so we say, if that's the case, I don't need to know what the actual shears are. I only need to know their relative magnitude. So here you see in the bottom here, we choose the wall strengths. In this case, we do it in proportion uh, to the length squared by choosing the same reinforcement ratio. And in that case, we can write this equivalent viscous damping value as being the sum of the lengths of the wall squared times their value of damping, which depends on the value of ductility for that wall, divided by the sum of the wall length squared. So again, we don't need to have any information about the strength of the structure to determine what that equivalent viscous damping of our equivalent single degree of freedom system is. What about for bridges? And here we take pretty much the most complex situation for a bridge. And what we look here is our bridge, which we've seen several times, with a flexible superstructure and with abutment movement as well, as will normally the case. And we'll say that there may be some inelastic action associated with the abutment. The superstructure, we'll say, is elastic, and the piers are inelastic. Oh, what's happened to my 
There we go. Here we go. So if we know what shears are taken by the individual piers and what shear is taken by the superstructure and what shear is taken by the abutments, well, first we can calculate, for example, the damping associated with each of those elements. And I've shown it here, a typical expression for one of the piers itself, where that's the ductility demand on that individual pier. Each pier will have a different ductility demand and therefore a different level of damping, but we can calculate them on an individual basis. And then we get this rather horrendous expression, which I'm going to come back to later on in, the, in the, this session, which looks at uh, the equivalent viscous damping in terms of the damping of the superstructure, the damping of the abutments, and the damping of the individual piers. It looks bad, but it's actually very simple to, to calculate. And again then, we can calculate what the system damping is for this rather complex structure and take that correctly into account. Vertical distribution. Let's say we've got to the stage of determining our base shear. How do we go from that to the design of the structure? And the first thing to do is to distribute that base shear to the locations of the individual discretized masses that we've chosen for the structure. And the expression here is very simple. It's rather similar to what's often used in an equivalent lateral force approach where we calculate the distribution of the base shear as being proportional to height times mass, which is incorrect. It should be displacement times mass, as shown here, uh, but the expression is very similar. So the force is distributed in proportion to floor mass and displacement, and I emphasize the similarity to force-based design where it's in proportion to mass and height often, but we'll see tomorrow that in buildings Typically, a concentrated force at roof level is needed for taller frame buildings to cope for higher mode effects at the very top. So we're not going to forget about higher mode effects, but we're not going to try and pretend that we can get a good feel from them, of them from a, a modal analysis procedure. OK, from now on and the rest of the day, we're going to talk about displacement-based design of bridges. Uh, particularly because this has been uh, requested of us to look at uh, bridges today and buildings tomorrow. So the first aspects that we're going to look at are single degree of freedom considerations and will be a fair amount of general background material here as well as stuff that's specifically relevant to displacement-based design. Just re-emphasizing some of the problems with uh, force-based design that if we take it into account correctly, then it tells us that in a simple structure like this under transverse response, we should be allocating most of the reinforcing steel and most of the shear resistance to this pier rather than the longer piers. We've already discussed this, so I won't go into it in any great detail. And we mentioned that this doesn't make any sense from a design point of view. Another aspect associated in general with this approach is uh, we've mentioned that codes are based typically on force reduction factors which are dependent on a code committee's idea as to what the ductility capacity of typical structural systems are. And a structural system might be a frame, it might be a wall building, it might be uh, a bridge. But these tend to be committee decisions and I've mentioned already by showing some examples that the, the value of that appropriate ductility or force reduction factor or behavior factor, whatever you like to call it, depends on where you are in the world rather than on rational analysis. And part of the reason for this is that there is very little agreement as to what the ductility capacity of a structure is. And there's two reasons for that. One is people can't agree on what the yield displacement is, and anyway, even if they did, they'd get it wrong, as we've mentioned before. And second, they can't agree on what the limit state displacement capacity is. So we, we're saying here, typically in force-based design, we need to know what the yield displacement is and what the ultimate displacement is or the limit state displacement is, and therefore what the ductility capacity is. But look at Look at the yield displacement. Depending on what part of the world you come from, the yield displacement 
might be the intersection of the initial stiffness with the nominal strength, it could be the onset of first yielding, or it could be the second stiffness through onset of first yielding to the nominal strength. And this last one is the most rational approach because it has greater relevance to the bilinear approximations of uh, structural performance that are, are implicit in code design. All right, so these values here, one and three, might differ by as much as a factor of three, three and a half even. And then what about the limit state? What about the, the damage control or ultimate limit state, or if we can distinguish between them? Some people in some countries will say, well, it's, it's the value at maximum moment. If you start to decrease from that, then you're past that limit state. Other people will say, well, it's actually when you get a, a 10 or a 20 or 25% or a 30% just decrease from either this value, the maximum, or the nominal value, which will be lower. And other people would say, well, the ultimate limit state, if it's reinforced concrete, will be when you get um, buckling of, of, of the longitudinal reinforcement or fracture of the transverse reinforcement or some such thing. So there is no agreement as to what characterizes the ultimate displacement. And if you can't agree on these two points, it's not surprising that you can't agree on what the ductility capacity of a structural system is. We've mentioned this or seen this slide before, and that is that it's assumed that structural systems have unique ductility capacity and hence a unique force reduction factor, and these are examples. And if we're looking at bridges, well, in fact, there often tends to be a bit more agreement, though it's not a rational agreement, but typically it's around about three to four is estimated to be the ductility capacity. Uh, Japan, about three. Europe, about three and a half. New Zealand, up to six. Again, New Zealand is probably a little bit high, but the question again to be asked here is if you're talking about a bridge and you're talking about a ductility capacity, what do you mean by ductility capacity? Do you mean the ductility of the most critical bridge pier or a characteristic ductility of a single degree of freedom system? Or are you talking about a force reduction factor applied to part of the, build, of the structure or all of it? For example, would you apply that force reduction factor to the reactions at the abutments when the superstructure remains elastic? Often that is done, but it's completely wrong. So, there's some problems associated with that. We've mentioned, we've seen this slide before, which indicates that even for a simple single degree of freedom system like this, the ductility capacity depends very much on the geometry, the aspect ratio of the pier itself. So if we can't get it right for such a simple element, we probably shouldn't be trying to do it for more complex uh, structures built up of many different elements with many different ductility demands. We also mentioned the difficulty associated with using a force reduction factor for a structure like this, which uh, is behaving in the transverse direction with, uh, in this case, locked in abutments which have no displacement at the abutments, but the superstructure remains elastic. We pointed out that using a force reduction factor associated with such an uh, a structure completely gets the distribution of, of lateral resistance between the superstructure and the substructure, the piers, wrong. And there is no way that you can get it right in a force-based design approach. You can't compensate for it, even if you uh, try to be sensible about doing it. We show that in displacement-based design, this is not an issue at all. We've also talked about this business of the importance of strength or the lack of importance of strength, which I won't bother to go through again, just mentioning that if you do detailed calculations of the influence of strength on the displacement demand capacity ratio, you find that if that strength is varied within a given geometry of the structure, it makes very little difference. So it's not a good indicator of the strength, of the safety of the structure at all. Well, just to get back to a few fundamentals uh, of uh, 
bridge section analysis and so forth, we need to look at perhaps some of the, uh, the different types of structures and sections we are dealing with, uh, typically either rectangular or circular. Uh, rectangular could be hollow, as could the circular one. Uh, we could have slab type piers, and we could have chamfered rectangular ones. So, and of course also we can have more complex ones, we can have architectural piers because very often um, the piers are what people underneath the bridge really see and they, they're very visual if you're going on a road underneath it and they often have architectural treatment which can make assessment of the performance of the individual piers more difficult. The first thing to remember is that generally almost exclusively, the design philosophy of bridges is to have elastic superstructures and ductile piers. In other words, we don't want any inelastic action happening in the superstructure itself because that will require repair after an earthquake and shutting down the, the bridge, perhaps. Whereas if there is some ductility demand and perhaps some spalling of cover concrete in the piers itself, this can generally be repaired without affecting the uh, serviceability of the bridge. You know, it can still be used for traffic above and below. A few points about the choice between rectangular and circular columns. It's pretty straightforward, these. Rectangular columns are less desirable because it's difficult to confine large sections with large numbers of reinforcing bars. If you've got a building column, which is perhaps uh, 600 by 600 or something of that sort of nature and maybe has 12 longitudinal bars in it, it's pretty easy to design your transverse reinforcement to confine those 12 bars. If you're talking about a rectangular bridge column which may be two and a half meters by two and a half meters and has 60 40 millimeter diameter longitudinal bars in it, it's very difficult to confine those adequately. So there's some problems associated with that. Displacement capacity of rectangular columns uh, in uh, the diagonal direction is reduced. That's something that's not often appreciated, that if you've got a rectangular or a square section and the seismic response is principally in a diagonal direction, then it, the cover concrete is going to spall at a much earlier stage because the neutral axis depth is larger. So that may govern the design if it's considered, though generally designers will consider the two orthogonal directions and perhaps not consider the diagonal direction. The strength and stiffness is different in principle in diagonal directions, though not much. If it's a rectangular column, typically that's not a terribly significant difference, 10%, that sort of level. Circular columns, of course, architects don't like circular columns, they're very boring, um, and it's harder to do a um, architectural detailing or finish on them that makes them more attractive. However, from the structural engineering point of view, they are much better in that it's easier to confine if you've got now your two and a half meter diameter uh, circular bridge column and you've got 60 bars in it. A single spiral going all around them will confine each of those bars as well as would be the case with the same percentages of reinforcement in a 600 millimeter diameter uh, core itself. So, the confinement is not an issue, it's not difficult. Uh, you can use either hoops or spirals and one of the things that I like to see, which is very rarely used, is to use pre-stressing strand, unstressed pre-stressing strand as the spiral reinforcement. Uh, it, it has a large elastic strain. It's much easier to detail because you don't have to weld it closed at each hoop, which you might have to do with uh, a limited length of reinforcing bar, you can just wind it round and anchor it properly uh, at maybe 10 meter height intervals. It's very economical and much more effective in confinement because of the high yield strain than is uh, conventional reinforcement. Of course you have omnidirectional strength, stiffness and displacement characteristics which makes assessment of design more simple. And, of course, most of this information is from another book that Michele and I have been involved in, uh, which some of you will be familiar with. Hollow columns, well, you know, large diameter, tall piers, hollow columns are often used. Uh, the seismic response of piers as vertical cantilevers is reduced if you get rid of the concrete in the middle of it. 
and you don't affect the strength or displacement characteristics significantly, though I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, single column piers, well, they're suitable for bearing supported superstructures. Eccentric live load may be a problem, but uh, not necessarily. Multi column piers, suitable for monolithic peer superstructure connections and they're attractive for wide multi-lane bridges um, because of course they reduce the influence of eccentric live load. Just a, a couple of examples here of the difference between uh, perhaps uh, bearing supported superstructures and uh, monolithic connection. Often of course in a uh, bearing supported uh, system with precast elements there will be a continuous deck slab over the top which uh, provides uh, some continuity for seismic moments as well as live load moments, but doesn't affect the dead load distribution. The advantage of this type of approach is that there's no significant superstructure seismic moments, uh, and it's a simple construction technique. The advantage of the monolithic system, as shown here, is that plastic hinges form at the top of the piers which means that if you've got a plastic hinge at the bottom as well, you have a more efficient system for resisting lateral shears. The pier size can be lower uh, to provide the, the given shear capacity. No bearings. Bearings also always cost money in terms of maintenance of, uh, of structures, of bridges. But we get increased moments in the superstructure from the seismic effects, because if we develop a plastic moment at the top of the pier, then that moment has to be resisted by moments in the superstructure on either side. So we need to take these into account. And typically it's more a matter of fashion and country as to which type of design is adopted. For example, in Europe, this type of design is very common. In California, almost always they use this sort of design. And it's more a matter of what people are used to rather than rational analysis as to what the most efficient system is. Soil structure interaction tends to be extremely important uh, in bridges and rather more important than it is in, uh, in buildings. You can get away sometimes in buildings by pretending that the structure is founded on a rigid foundation. You can't really do that in, uh, in bridges and we need to consider whether what sort of support system we need to use. And if, if we're taking into account uh, the type of foundation, if we've got perhaps a spread footing, we would use this for strong ground, ground conditions, either rock or strong alluviums. But we do need to remember that there is flexibility in the soil, and under the lateral forces, there will be uh, some rotation of the base. And that rotation of the base will increase the yield displacement will have very little difference on the plastic rotation capacity because when the hinge starts to form at the base of the column itself, then the moment is constant or more or less constant on the foundation. So there is no increase in the foundation rotations. But that will influence the ductility capacity and it will also influence the damping because the foundation rotation will typically have a larger damping associated with it than will be the case with the damping of the superstructure. And the part, sorry, not of the superstructure, but of the piers themselves. So again, in force-based design, how do you take that into account? How do you take into account the general behavior of this? Well, you can certainly take into account the rotation of the foundation, though probably you won't use that to determine the fact that your ductility capacity of the structure is reduced the reason that it's reduced is that the plastic displacement is independent of the foundation, but the yield displacement is the sum of the structural yield, that's the flexibility of the pier, plus the foundation rotation. So that should be taken into account in bridge design, but generally isn't. And the second thing you can't do in the force-based design is to represent the increased damping associated with the foundation flexibility, but in our case, we'll come back to this later on, it's easy to determine the damping associated with the structural deformation and the damping associated with the foundation rotation and combine them together to get an equivalent viscous damping of the structural system itself. If we have, hello, yep, 
If we have this type of design, very common in California, where the, we call it a column shaft or a pile, a, a pile shaft type design, where the pile and the column are the same, that is, the diameter doesn't change, then what tends to happen is we get a plastic hinge forming down below ground level. Of course, you can modify this design and have the, the pile of a larger diameter, that's the, the, the drilled hole that you put the, the pile in, a larger diameter than the rest of the column, which would force the plastic hinge to occur at this location. And that's what's done in New Zealand. This uniform one is what's done in California. I like the New Zealand uh, approach better. But there are some problems associated with determining the ductility capacity associated with this type of system in that the elastic displacement now depends not just on what occurs above the potential plastic hinge, but there will be curvature in the pile below. So we see that the yield displacement profile looks like this, which includes a component due to plastic rotation at the hinge level itself. And when we look at the plastic rotation, this is all concentrated in the hinge at this location here, which is a bit of a variable. And again, dependent on the geometry of the structure, it will influence the ductility capacity of the system and the damping as well. Typically, damping associated with the foundation here is about 10%, whereas the structural one will depend on the ductility demand. And of course, the third case where we've got weak surface soil conditions and the, the footing is supported on piles, so straightforward. Though again, we need to be able to determine what the translation and rotation of the pile cap is and what the damping associated with this would be and what significance that has on both the yield displacement and the total design displacement and ductility. But these are straightforward issues which can be incorporated within the displacement-based approach in, in a fairly simple fashion. We will come back to some of those uh, later on. Other aspects that I didn't mention there is, what about the bearings? What about the displacement in bearings in a bearing-supported superstructure? We'll come back to that. In terms of abutment design, then short bridges may be locked into the abutment, so reducing uh, resonant response. These are just some factors influencing the overall behavior. Uh, provided the abutments can be depended on, then the structure itself perhaps needs little seismic consideration. Movement joints, it's worthwhile remembering that sections on opposite sides of movement joints are unlikely to move in phase, and it's difficult to model this accurately for seismic response. And often the appropriate thing is to consider sections of bridge between movement joints as separate elements but taking some consideration of the adjacent frames on either side. Multiple long span bridges, uh, multiple span long bridges, sorry, if we have something or other where the length of the bridge is perhaps a kilometer or something of that sort of nature, as McKelly will be giving an example uh, in the next session where the bridge was 58 spans long, uh, then if you've got something of that length, is it likely that all of the piers are going to be moving in, in phase? And the answer is no, it's extremely unlikely that that will occur, either longitudinally or transversely. So it doesn't make any sense to do a, a model of the structure which is based on that assumption itself. Again, probably better to take segments of the bridge, make sure each of those segments can resist the seismic design independently. Um, recognizing that, in fact, they are likely to move more independently than together. P-delta effects. Bridge drifts are often quite large. 4% uh, drift and even 5% drift are not uncommon when we design bridges for the damage control limit state governed by strains. And often there's no particular reason why we should put an arbitrary drift limit on a bridge because of the fact that the uh, there are no non-structural elements or few non-structural elements to consider. Now that's much larger than we tolerate for buildings and as a consequence, P-delta effects tend to be more significant uh, for bridges than they are for buildings. Another bullet that we can consider is inelastic time history analysis design verification. 
The whole, I'll come back to that tomorrow in general terms, but the design process is a very simple design process that we use. If we need to do a design verification, then perhaps the best thing to do is inelastic time history analysis. Bridge behaviour is complex, but it's not complex because there are large numbers of different structural elements. It's the geometry that creates the complexity. You might have perhaps 10 degrees of freedom in a bridge design, which is very little, but those, each of those may be geographically or, or geometrically distributed in an awkward fashion. So the modelling effort is very small in doing an inelastic time history analysis. Consequently, the behaviour is complex, the modelling effort is low, and inelastic time history design verification is a realistic choice for bridges. And I think that we should be moving more towards that uh, region, which is why the, the CD at the back of the book that we've got here includes two inelastic time history analyses methods, each of them worth 10 times, 20 times the cost of the book. You've got a bargain if you buy it. The, of course, one of them programs is, is free off the internet as well. Uh, the inelastic mode shape is often less well defined for transverse responsive bridges than for buildings and some iteration may be required in the displacement based design process which is uncommon for building design. Now the elements of the displacement based design, I've shown here the equations for buildings but I've done this deliberately because all except the bottom equation here, which is for effective height and which has no relevance for bridge design, are exactly the same. So we have an expression for the effective stiffness, an expression for the base shear force, the design displacement, and the effective mass. And from the design displacement and the ductility, of course, the damping, which we've seen here. So the information that we have is sufficient for what we need to do. Just a few comments about concrete properties and then material properties to be used in design. And again, this is going to be a bit more general than just uh, for bridge structures, though we'll use the bridge as an example of this sort of thing. First, it's important to remember that we are changing the characteristics of the concrete very considerably by confining it in plastic hinge regions. We increase the strength and we also increase the usable strain typically to hoop fracture by a very considerable amount compared with unconfined concrete. And we can write expressions for the confined strength of the concrete, the stress strain curve of the concrete, uh, various other aspects like that, which I don't propose to go into in any detail, except to remember that the confined strength of the concrete is related to the unconfined strength as a function of the lateral confining pressure exerted by the transverse reinforcement at yield. This is the so-called Mander et al. expression. As far as the reinforcing steel properties are concerned, it's uh, important to recognise that we are not just yielding with, uh, not just dealing with the behaviour up to yield, but we're interested in the post-yield characteristics as well because the structure that we're designing, the bridge column, is certain to yield and to move into the inelastic range if we're talking about the damage control limit state. So we better have information about this, informa this sort of part of the stress strain uh, equation as well. And again, we have expressions uh, for describing that, which I won't bother to go in in any detail. What about the strain limits that we might use? Uh, Michele has talked about how we would go from strain limits to the limit state curvatures, uh, but we need to know what values we would use for those limit state strains. Uh, values are shown here. Typically, for the serviceability limit state strain for reinforce for the concrete itself, we would use a maximum strain of 0.004 because it's very rare to see any signs of even incipient spalling. In the plastic hinge region, which is confined by a uh, adjacent member. For example, at the base of a column, there is some confinement to the plastic hinge formed by the foundation itself, and this inhibits the spalling of concrete to something at least 0.004 and perhaps something a little larger. 
In terms of damage control, then basically we have something or other where we can relate that to the volumetric ratio of the transverse reinforcement, its yield strength, and the strain at maximum stress of the transverse reinforcement divided by the confined strength. So this is an expression which has been around for a while but still seems to be pretty good and it's, uh, it's conservative by about 30% in comparison with the strain of which you would expect to get a uh, fracture of transverse reinforcement. So we could say then ultimate strain would be about 1.5 times this level. But that would be our best estimate of the strain at fracture. For the steel limit strains then, we would say serviceability would depend, uh, the serviceability is, is associated with the residual crack widths. So we, we get the, if the crack opens up too widely, then it's not going to close completely after the earthquake and we may have to do some grouting of the crack width to ensure that we don't get uh, subsequent corrosion values. And values between 0.01 and 0.015 are appropriate, depending on the exposure. If you're in a marine environment, you know, close to the sea, where corrosion is a real problem, then I would be using 1%. Perhaps in a, in a region which is more benign, we would allow 1.5%. Damage control, typically we allow about 0.5 of the strain at maximum stress for the transverse reinforcement. And for ultimate, something about 0.7 to 0.9 are, are values that are typically used. Now let's look at how we choose the material strengths that we use for displacement-based design. This relates, of course, to bridges, but not only to bridges itself. In force-based design, what we do is to determine a required moment in the plastic hinge region, and then we make sure that the dependable moment capacity, which is the nominal moment capacity, multiplied by some strength reduction factor, exceeds, or at least equals, the required moment capacity. There's a good question that can be asked. What on earth is this strength reduction factor doing here? What's it doing there in seismic design ever? Now, what's it doing in general? You know, where does it come from? Well, it comes from gravity design. We've got a simple beam, and we've got some loads on it, and we've got some uncertainty about the material strengths associated with it. Well, if we calculate the moment capacity uh, fairly conservatively, but then something happens, uh, the reinforcing steel is not quite as strong as it should be, or the bars have been placed inaccurately, or the concrete strength is lower than specified, then the actual moment capacity can be less than the nominal moment capacity. And if the loads are high, then what happens? That, that it fails, bang. So it's important to have a strength reduction factor for gravity loads. But what about seismic design? Now, the whole philosophy of seismic design is completely different. Here's uh, an idealized relationship between strength and displacement and we characterize this by a bilinear response. But we know that that strength here is much less than what would occur if the structure had unlimited elastic strength and the same stiffness. So that would be the actual strength itself. So if we say here's the required strength itself and we will uh, actually be conservative and design in this sort of fashion here, then what we know is that the actual strength is likely, you know, likely to be substantially higher than the nominal strength and very much higher than the, the required strength. So the actual strength is going to be up here. But does that mean that the structure hasn't reached its ultimate strength in the design level earthquake? No, of course not. Here's the strength we'd have to put in if the structure was going to respond elastically. So have we gained anything by increasing the strength to this? Well, uh, conventional design would say by increasing that strength by 25% or whatever it might have done, we have reduced the ductility demand and therefore have made the structure safer. Good thing. We've already shown that that's not the case, that by increasing the strength, we will increase the safety by an almost infinitesimal value. So what are we really doing? What we're doing is we're making our structure less safe, not less safe, but less economical. We've put in unnecessary strength. Now, when we come to do the capacity design, when we determine what the shear strength requirements are, 
we have to say, well, we were really designing for this strength here, but this is our actual nominal strength, and we put onto that the fact that the reinforcing strength may be much higher than that. Our potential maximum feasible strength is somewhere up here, so we've got to design that as the strength for shear. You can see we're adding conservatism on conservatism there, and we're doing this unnecessarily. So we note that in force-based design, the actual capacity may be as high as 50% times the nominal one. Strain hardening and confinement increase the strength still further, and this wretched force reduction factor for flexure should not be included in force-based design at all. And that's now fortunately becoming more common, uh, particularly in bridge design, is to get rid of that force reduction factor, uh, uh, strength reduction factor associated with flexure. What do we do in displacement-based design? Well, we go one stage further because we recognize that the actual flexural strength is not terribly important. The limit state displacements are important, uh, and the limit state, the, the, the capacity itself, should be a best estimate of what we would do. So instead of, instead of taking perhaps the, the specified 28-day strength for the concrete, we say, what's a realistic value for this strength when the earthquake comes? Well, we don't know when the earthquake comes, but it's not going to come at 28 days unless your structure is built extremely quickly and you're very unlucky. So at one year, what is the strength going to be? In fact, at 28 days, what is the strength going to be of the concrete? Well, if you get it from a ready mix concrete firm, they will have a target strength, typically, which is 20% higher than the specified strength to make sure that uh, due to normal variations, you, when it tests out at 28 days, it's not below the 28 day strength. So the probable 28 day strength is 1.2 times F prime C. When the earthquake comes, probably about 1.5 F prime C is more realistic. But we suggest using a conservative value of 1.3 in the design as being a realistic lower estimate of the probable strength at the time of the earthquake. As far as reinforcing steel or structural steel is concerned, we would use a value of 1.1 times the specified or characteristic yield strength of the material. So that again makes for more efficiency in the design without sacrificing safety in any sense. If we want to calculate the maximum feasible strength, and we need to know that for capacity design of the structures, in other words, to determine what the maximum possible moment is, then we have other suggestions for the material strengths. Here we'll take 1.7 times F prime C as the probable maximum of the concrete strength. And we could use 1.3. In fact, this is an error here. This should be 1.3. As you'll see in the book, it's 1.3. So please make a correction to that in your notes. Uh, this, the expected uh, value should be 1.3 times this. Then in design, to determine the strength, we could go a number of different ways to determine this. One of the things that we could uh, do is just to use standard tables with the material strengths to determine the, uh, the flexural strength capacity for a given section. But we recommend that where possible, you use moment curvature analysis because if you do a moment curvature analysis of the critical sections, you get very good ideas as to not just what the strength is, what the strain hardening portion of the response is, what the limit state curvatures are. There is good information given in the books, but you can get this more accurate. But it also means that you can form uh, simple bilinear characteristics that are more accurate than the ones we estimate and use in the design itself. The important thing is that the nominal yield curvature, as Michele has already mentioned, is not when you get to first yield or anything. It's an extrapolation of the secant stiffness through first yield to the nominal strength that we would use in design. Um, first yield is when the reinforcing steel gets to yield, the extreme tension bar, or when the concrete gets to a strain of 0.002. The expressions that we've got in general sense in the book are perfectly adequate for design. If you want to refine it, you can use this sort of approach here. And you can use a, a similar approach from that to determine the post yield stiffness, which may be of value too. Um, some general information, I don't think, I think I'll skip this. It's, uh, 
just mentioning, well, just to mention very briefly, if we have a simple bridge pier of this sort of nature and moments distributed in that sort of fashion itself, then we could determine what the curvature distribution is from the moment curvature characteristics and integrate that to get the displacement. The point is that this approach, so it's mathematically nice, is uh, not very accurate because it doesn't uh, take into account tension shift, that's diagonal cracking under shear effects, no shear deformation, no anchorage deformation because the strains continue down into the foundation and there are problems with strain softening. So we don't use this approach, we use the approach which has been around for years and years, which is to have a linear yield profile and a plastic hinge of specified lengths over which the curvature is assumed to be equal and constant, but equal to the limit state curvature. And the plastic hinge length is calibrated so that you get it correct, you get the displacements correct. So the plastic hinge length is the sum of uh, the distance, in this case it says LC, but it's the distance to the point of contraflexure, times some constant, plus the strain penetration length, and that's the depth into which the, into the foundation that we can consider the strain in the reinforcing steel to be essentially constant. And this value of K depends on the ratio of the ultimate capacity, the ultimate stress to the yield stress of the flexural reinforcement with a maximum value of 0 0.08, and the strain penetration depends on the yield stress of the flexural reinforcement and the, the uh, diameter of the reinforcing steel. Um, I don't need to go into those two things, but I think we'll get straight into the next phase, which is looking at the longitudinal seismic design of the bridge itself. We've mentioned that this causes problems for force-based design unless you're an intelligent designer and make the appropriate adjustments. Of course, any force-based design can be made to work well, provided it is considered rationally. And I would emphasize that most of the designs that are done in force-based design are perfectly safe, particularly if we have good detailing associated with them. But the safety is not uniform. So some structures will get damaged in a level of earthquake which is very different from what other structures will do. So we get a very non-uniform risk associated with force-based design. Um, I'm saying that at uh, Javier's request. <laughs> Say that the, you don't have to throw force-based design out uh, completely. And I would emphasize also that there's a lot of the information that's in this book and in these lectures which can be used in combination with force-based design to improve force-based design. So you don't have to leave this immediately and never do a force-based design again or anything. And it doesn't necessarily mean that your existing structures are terribly unsafe. In terms of displacement-based design, the longitudinal seismic design is comparatively straightforward, whereas for force-based design, it's not. Essentially, we're dealing with a single degree of freedom problem, and complexity arises from different pier heights, from friction in the bearings, particularly at abutments, and also from foundation flexibility. But all of these can be considered very easily. First, we look at the yield displacement for bridges. If we have a solid circular column, then we can express the yield curvature by this expression here. This is just a, a constant times the flexural reinforcement yield strain divided by the diameter. And a similar expression, very little difference in fact, for rectangular columns. And it's worthwhile noting that these equations are reasonable for hollow columns as well. Since strength and stiffness is dominated by the material at the maximum distance from the centroid, and that concrete that you're taking out in the hollow column really doesn't participate significantly in the structural response. It is worthwhile noting, however, that lower ultimate curvatures apply for uh, hollow columns because the failure mechanism is almost always by implosion. What happens is that when the strain, the longitudinal strain on the inside surface of the, uh, the hollow column itself reaches about 0 0.006, then it starts to spall on the inside as well as the outside, and you suddenly get a, a loss of your compression zone completely. 
And so it's a very rapid failure where it occurs. It doesn't really matter too much uh, because normally when you have a hollow column, it's a very tall column, and normally very tall columns respond probably elastically. But this slide here just shows the difference in the moment curvature relationship between two identical columns except that one of them has uh, the inside core taken out. So it has the same axial load, the same outside diameter, the same flexural reinforcement content. And you can see that the diameter of this is 4 meters, the inside diameter is 3.2 meters, the axial load ratio of the solid column is 0.05, whereas for the hollow column it comes up to 0.14 because of the smaller area. Reinforcement ratio for the solid column 2% and 5.5% for the hollow column. And you can see that up until you get to the critical strain for the hollow column, the difference in behavior between the solid column and the hollow column is almost nothing. So certainly you can use the same expression for estimating the yield displacement and the yield curvature, whether you've got a solid column or a hollow one. And the same thing applies for rectangular columns. In terms of the yield displacement from the yield curvature, well, it depends, obviously, on the foundation, uh, on the fixity conditions. And there are various uh, examples shown here. A typical one with a rigid base and a pin top, rigid top and bottom, rigid top and pin bottom, common in the United States to reduce foundation forces. And in any of these cases, we can describe the yield displacement as some constant, a third, a twelfth, whatever is appropriate, times the height plus the strain penetration squared. If we're dealing with other elements like this, uh, where we've got a flexible foundation, then we need to determine what the additional yield displacement due to foundation flexibility is concerned. And if we're dealing with a pile column with a point of contraflexure in the depth, we can again use this expression here, but uh, we need to have different values for the C value here, which is shown here. There is a lot of design details given in the in the bridge for in the book for the uh, for different height over depth. Let's go back one. Here's the height divided by the diameter. So that aspect ratio of the column governs the depth of the plastic hinge where it's going to form, and it also governs the value of C1 that we would use to estimate what the displacement is. So that information, which is not so easy to calculate. Uh, is shown for sands and clays in the book itself. Now, I mentioned that in some cases uh, the piers may be flexible enough to respond elastically to the design earthquake, and this is particularly the case for very tall piers itself. And we provide some information here on the typical yield displacements uh, for different heights of columns and different diameters, as you can see here. And you can see that in some cases well, clearly a two meter diameter column at a height of 40 meters is not terribly likely to occur, but you could be down at something like this, a four meter diameter column with a height of 40 meters or even larger than that. And you can see that the yield displacement there is 0.8 meters, and that's a pretty big displacement. Now, how many earthquakes are going to induce a displacement as big as 0.8 meters? Well, that's a good question to ask, and here's an answer to it. What we've done here on this side uh, is to compare that last diagram, but expressed in a slightly different fashion. Now, instead of having the height here, we've put the aspect ratio, just the height divided by the diameter, and here is the height of the column itself, and here is those yield displacements. So it's the same information presented in a slightly different fashion. And we can, can compare that with the plateau displacement, which occurs in the earthquake, from the expressions that Michele was presenting this morning. And we can rework that, as I'll explain tomorrow a little bit more detail, to express it in terms of peak ground acceleration rather than distance from an earthquake and the moment magnitude of the earthquake itself. So the, the distance is incorporated in those two things, but it's again expressed in a slightly different fashion. So what this says is that if we go in with a particular aspect ratio and a particular height of column, that says that the yield displacement, in this case, is about 
0.6 metres itself. How does that compare with the maximum displacement of different earthquakes? And we see here it actually happens to correspond to a 0.4 g peak ground acceleration caused by a magnitude 7.2 earthquake. So that's a pretty big earthquake. You know, that's, that's a serious sort of earthquake. So if the earthquake is smaller than that, or if the moment magnitude causing it is smaller than that, then the structure is going to respond elastically. And you can use very simplified uh, design characteristics. Notice that this is something that is independent of, you, you don't get this information from force-based design, but you do from displacement-based considerations. Michele has mentioned how we go from the limit straight curvatures associated with the limit state strains to determine what is the critical curvature and then how we calculate the design displacement. So we don't need to displace, consider that in any more detail, apart from a couple of aspects which are not necessarily known at the start of the design. One of these is to say, well, the limit straight strain associated with the concrete limit state, sorry, the limit state curvature associated with the concrete limit state strain is equal to the limit state strain divided by the depth of the neutral axis, the depth of the compression zone. And we don't know this value here at the start of the design process. So the same thing, the limit state uh, curvature associated with the steel also incorporates this value. Not quite so sensitive to it, but it is still important. If we're looking at the, the uh, damage control limit state for concrete, it depends on the amount of, of, sorry, the confined strength of the concrete, and the confined strength of concrete depends on the volumetric ratio and the yield strength of the transverse reinforcement. So again, we don't necessarily know that information. If we did, then we can get directly to the design displacement. Well, we provide some additional design aids to help with that sort of thing. For example, here is the neutral axis depth, uh, non-dimensionalized by dividing by the diameter of a bridge column itself, shown for different reinforcement ratios and for different axial load ratios. Now normally in the start of the design process, you know what the axial load ratio is on the column itself. You don't know what the reinforcement ratio is, but you see that this is very flat. You can have big errors in the assumption about the reinforcement ratio and only have small variations in C. So typically, you might start the design by saying, I'll assume that we've got 2% reinforcement, and therefore I've got a first pretty good idea on what that value for the depth of the compression zone is, and I don't anticipate that I'll be out by more than, say, 10% maximum. I might need to do another iteration, but it's going to be a pretty small one. Similarly, you may well have an idea of how much transverse reinforcement you're going to put in your column at the start of the design process, just because of past experience. If you do, and you know what its yield strength is, then basically what you can do is to come into one of these where we say transverse reinforcement ratio, we know that. The ratio of the yield stress of the transverse reinforcement to the expected strength of the concrete, we know that. So we can just go up here and see what the ratio of the confined strength of the concrete is to the unconfined concrete strength. So pretty straightforward. That information then enables us to go into our design process in a, in a fairly simple fashion without necessarily doing information, uh, doing iteration. We also look at uh, uh, the behavior for pile common, columns. Uh, the top hinge, the plastic hinge length is standard, just as we've had before. It depends on the depth to the neutral axis, it, sorry, the depth to the point of contraflexure. And for the in-ground plastic hinge, it depends on the, the, uh, the height of the contraflexure itself and uh, the, the distance essentially from there down to the plastic hinge. So it's a, it's a much longer plastic hinge because it can form on both sides of this critical section. And so we get uh, quite large rotations there for quite small curvatures, which is good because we don't want to have to come and inspect that after an earthquake. And we'll probably have more conservative limit state strains for that location. These are, we've already had these in terms of the displacement, so I'll move on past. 
Systems damping for longitudinal design, well, on an individual peer basis, if we have damping, uh, if we have the potential for a plastic hinge firming at, say, the base, and then at the top of a column, these may occur at different, uh, different uh, displacements slightly. We can still approximate this by a bilinear characteristic, determine the, the damping by dividing the limit state displacement by the yield displacement of the bilinear characteristic and determine its characteristic uh, char simply. If we have different peers have different heights, remember we looked at that sort of structure many times, we determine the ductility and damping of each peer. We determine, therefore, the equivalent system damping by weighting the shears carried by each peer by its damping and divided by the sum of the shears. And again, we won't know the absolute values of these, but we'll probably make a rational decision to put the same flexural reinforcement ratio in each of the columns itself. If that's the case, then we do know what the relative shears are, the, the, relative, the ratio of the shears, and we can calculate this system damping. If we have bearings associated with this, then we know that there will be some, you know, say, an elastomeric bearing. An elastomeric bearing may well have some quite considerable damping associated with it. It will certainly have some displacement associated with it. So we can look at the case here if we compare the yield displacement and the limit state displacement, you can see that we have structural displacement and the pier and bearing displacement itself. If we separate these two out, we can say that this is the pier hysteretic characteristic. We can determine what the ductility associated with it is, and we can therefore calculate the damping associated with the pier. We can look at the bearing hysteresis characteristics which we all know from the manufacturer, and we know the displacement of this. And the important thing to recognize is that the shear is essentially the same in the bearing and in the pier itself, apart from some slight increase here due to the mass of the pier. But in that case, since the shear is the same, the shear falls out of the equation, and the equivalent viscous damping is just the, uh, the damping of the system as shown here. This is the pier yield displacement plus the uh, plastic displacement, so that's the total displacement of the pier. Here's the total displacement of the bearing times its damping, and we divide that by the sum of the displacements to get the equivalent viscous damping. So we can incorporate this and the foundation flexibility extremely easily into the displacement-based design and to determine the appropriate level of damping. We also have values for pier damping for pile columns which I won't bother to go into any detail, apart from to show that the values are typically around about the 15% level and uh, are very flat as the ductility increases. And they're shown for uh, sands and for clay situations there. Now, I've gone for an hour and a quarter. I, I will just go for a little bit longer. In fact, we're not due to finish this session, but. I'm going to look at some design examples very quickly and not in great detail. And then Michele is going to take over with some more glamorous stuff afterwards uh, associated with real structures. And so I'll get this boring stuff out of the way. Then we'll take a break and Michele can, can, can wow you all with his uh, real structures. So I wanted to, to look at some design examples uh, and to show various aspects of the numerical values that we might come across, and just to go through line by line, but very quickly, to show what sort of numbers happen and how do we go about it. And there's this one particular example that we use rather frequently in the, uh, in the, in the book to look at different aspects of performance, both longitudinally and transversely. And you can see that the structure is characterized by piers of different lengths, a short pier in the middle, so the ground level sort of comes up and there and then down again, and two longer piers on either side. The pier lengths, the span lengths are different. The acceleration response spectrum is taken from the Californian ATC32 document, which also has the displacement spectra in it. And the reason for doing this one is to show you that we don't have to have a linear displacement spectra. 
it can be a curved one. It's perfectly straightforward to incorporate this in the design itself. So this is the 5% damping value itself. Now these two curves down here are values that come out for longitudinal and transverse design later on, dependent on the ductility, the system ductility that we, we work on. So eventually, we'll come back to these levels here. Now, the example considers different fixity conditions. That's different fixity at the top and bottom of the piers itself, and also considers the effect of foundation of abutment friction. How do you consider abutment friction in a force-based design? Well, you can't. But in displacement-based design, you can say, well, if that occurs, I have some idea of what the force, the vertical force, is in the reaction of the abutment. If I know what the friction characteristics are, we know that that's going to help provide some damping to the structure and reduce the seismic response. We can incorporate that design, or if you feel uncomfortable with it, you can ignore it. But at least the mechanism is there to be able to do it. Now, I'm not going to go through the examples, example, I'll go through some of them. Example one is just determining what the displacement capacity is of this first pier itself and what its uh, ductility is. Example 10.3 looks at the longitudinal seismic design with a number of different design assumptions and possibilities. And example 10.5 looks at the transverse uh, behavior itself. Just hang on a second. Michele, what time is the session due to finish? Can you see from the front of it? What, what time is the session due to finish? I just want to see. Well, that's right. <laughs> Everybody else knows. Uh, right. No, we're meant to be already in coffee break, are we? Nearly. OK, well, I'll just do the first of these examples and then stop for coffee. Um, I thought we were going along in that. Right, the first one then is just the design displacement. How do you calculate the design displacement for the central column itself? We have the column diameter is two meters, clear height is 12 meters, axial load we calculate from the given information and the problem is 10 mega newtons. The specified concrete strength is 30 megapascals, so the value we use in design is 1.3 times that. The specified yield strength for 20 megapascals, so we use 1.3 one times that to get 462. So those are the design material properties. We're given the ratio of the ultimate to yield, 1.35, and the bar diameters that we're going to use for vertical uh, reinforcement and transverse reinforcement, and also the cover. So the book considers a column fixed top and bottom, column pinned to the superstructure, and the footing replaced by a pile column design. And we'll just very briefly look at the first one, where essentially what we do first is to calculate the core diameter. And on the, cons on the basis of that, and with the transverse reinforcement detail which is given, we can calculate the volumetric ratio of transverse reinforcement. Then we can calculate, I don't know if it's there, yeah, from this expression here, which we've shown you before, what the confined concrete strength is. With that, uh, we can also calculate the uh, no, nope, I've gone too far. There we go, back to here. So we calculate the, um, the, we calculate what the ratio of this is and we calculate what the confined strength of the concrete is. We can therefore calculate the damage control limit state strain, which tames, comes out to be 0.0136. And we can then look at the column axial load. We said this comes out to be 0.0816. We estimate from this expression here what the neutral axis depth is. And this comes out to be 0.24 times the column diameter. And it enables us to calculate what the limit state curvatures are. And we see the concrete value shown here is smaller than the steel-based value, and this governs the design. We've seen those. The next point, then, is to calculate the plastic hinge length. Here's the expression that we had for the plastic hinge length, which is 0.2 times this ratio, which is 1.35 minus 1. And that comes out to be something of 0.07 is the value to put in that expression. And then, with the diameter as 40 millimeters, the strain penetration length 
is found to be 407 millimetres. Hence, with the column in double bending, and since it's fixed at the top, the effective distance from the maximum section to the point of contraflexure is half of the column height, 6 metres, and we calculate the plastic hinge length as 0.83 metres. We then calculate the design displacement. First of all, the yield curvature is found using this expression we've had before. So that comes out to be 0.0026 per metre. The strain penetration applies both top and bottom, and the effective length for the yield displacement is thus the height plus twice the strain penetration. And as a consequence, we find that the yield displacement for the column comes out to be 71 millimetres. The design displacement is then found by just summing the yield displacement with the plastic displacement, and the plastic displacement is the, the limit state curvature minus the yield curvature times the plastic hinge length times the height. And so that's 0.07, that's this value here, plus the limit state curvature, we had that in the previous slide, minus the yield curvature, also previously calculated, times the plastic hinge length times 12, which is the clear height between the plastic hinge locations, and that gives us a design displacement of 0.326, and the corresponding displacement ductility capacity is then equal to 4.58. Now, right at quarter past, I know we started a bit late, so I think I'll, I'll stop there, and after, after the break, I'll just very quickly go through the other two examples. The point is not to look at the numbers, but to show that the procedure and the calculations are extremely simple and straightforward, even for a moderately complex structure. And uh, to continue on from where we were at the end of the last session, I mentioned that the design examples, several of them revolve around this particular structure. I don't intend to go through them in any detail now, but the second example looks at the overall longitudinal design of the bridge using displacement-based principles. It considers three cases, fixed column superstructure design with frictionless abutments, pin column superstructure design also with frictionless abutments, and then pin column superstructure design including abutment friction. And we'll only just look very briefly at uh, the first case. And I don't intend to go through anything in any details. We've already calculated the displacement capacity of the first of the central pier, and clearly we can do the same thing for this two outer piers as well. And consequently, we can calculate the, the uh, ductility demand on all, all of the piers itself, and therefore the damping associated with piers B and D, which are these ones here, we calculated beforehand the displacement ductility for the central pier, also the displacement ductility for these ones itself, and uh, we can calculate, therefore, the two levels of, of damping and combine these together using the general expression, which we have already shown, to come up with a system damping of 0.15. From this, we get the spectral reduction factor which uh, is found to be 0.66. We apply that to the spectrum, just go briefly to that again, and that gives us the displacement spectra curve for the appropriate level of damping. And that enables us to calculate the period, from the period, the effective stiffness, and hence the base shear force. We distribute that in inverse proportion to the heights of the columns itself, and that tells us what the shears and the moments are for each of the piers itself. And finally, I'll talk about this more tomorrow. We do a P-delta check to see whether we need to be bothered by the P-delta moments. The P-delta moments, of course, are as we increase the displacement, the vertical load provides a moment as well as the lateral force. 
and this reduces the capacity of the structure. But I don't intend to talk to that today. I'll talk with that in some more detail tomorrow. When we get in the design process for the transverse response, it's somewhat more complex, and issues to be considered include the transverse displacement profile, which we've already mentioned, possibility of dual seismic load paths, effective system damping, the degree of fixity at the column top, and we note that generally some iteration will be required. We've already seen this, uh, this equation here and this slide where we have to know what the inelastic mode shape is, and this may involve some guesswork at the start to determine what the critical uh, peer capacity is, the central column in this case, and therefore to scale up the, the um, mode shape by the ratio of the critical displacement at uh, the central pier to the displacement uh, of the mode shape itself. And that enables us to calculate the damping value itself. Sorry, the, the effective displacement. These we've already seen. We would choose the appropriate mode shape, which in our case is similar to the one down here. Uh, lost that again, down, down to the bottom corner here, this one. Now, we've mentioned already this uh, expression for the displacement. We have to determine what the shears and the piers are. We have to determine how much shear is taken by the superstructure and how much, therefore, by the abutments to determine what the total uh, damping, the effective damping of the system is. And this is difficult at the start of the design process. <coughs> What we do is to make an, uh, an initial assumption of how much of these inertia forces, F1, F2, F3 to F5, how much of that is carried by superstructure flexure and how much of it is carried by bending of the piers itself. And we won't know that at the start of the design process, but typically we'll assume that that's 0.5 or 50%. So that's this value here. 50%, that's the assumption that's made here. If we make that assumption, then we can determine the relative shear carried by the piers, which will be one minus this value of x times the total base shear, and then that distributed between these piers in inverse proportion to their heights. So we can get something as an initial estimate which tells us what fraction of the inertia forces are carried by each of these actions, and that enables us to determine what the damping of each of the elements are and what the system damping is from these aspects. And that's essentially what we see in this expression here. That value of x is our estimate of the total amount of the inertia that's carried by the abutments and the superstructure, and these are the values taken by the peers. So it's just a long expression, but it's straightforward. The design process involves the estimation of that fraction of the lateral force x carried back to the abutments, as I mentioned, estimate the displacement shape, determine the displacement capacities of the piers, and therefore determine the critical pier, clearly the central pier in this case, and then that gives us a first approximation to the displacement profile. We then determine the characteristic displacement, the effective mass, determine the yield displacements, and hence the ductilities, therefore the damping of each pier, determine the ratio of shear force carried by the piers, and that's a designer's choice, but typically we would design with the same flexural reinforcement in each pier, then determine the system damping, using the expression in the previous slide, and then straightforward to determine the uh, effective period and the base shear, the total structural base shear for the design of the element, of the bridge itself. Then we have to do an analysis of the system and it's a bit difficult to know what we're analyzing because we don't know what the strength of the piers are at that stage. And what we have to do is to estimate the effective stiffness of the piers. Um, we know what the shear is based on our assumption of x, and we also know what the displacements are in each of those piers. So we have an estimate from the effective stiffness at maximum displacement response. 
note that this is dependent on two assumptions. One is the shape of the deflection and the second is the percentage of the total inertia forces that have been taken uh, by the superstructure bending. So having got those estimates for the stiffness of the, of the piers itself and knowing the stiffness of the superstructure which remains elastic, we analyze the structure using a conventional stiffness analysis to obtain the pier displacements which we then compare with both the critical displacements and the assumed level. And we make modifications both to the shape and to the value of x, the proportion taken by transverse bending to improve the, the um, convergence. And typically this takes about two or maybe three cycles. But it's, it's a simple but messy sort of process. And we have the design example shown in the notes itself. Uh, of course, it's explained in more detail in the book. But because it's um, rather long-winded, I don't propose to go through it. If you read through it, it will be exactly the same as me talking about it. So I, I just leave it to you to go through in some detail to see what the end results are. You can see there's many slides to do it. Now, one thing I mentioned earlier is that it's easier, the longitudinal design is much easier than the transverse design uh, because of the fact that we don't have to consider this complex deflected shape. For bridges that are restrained laterally but free longitudinally at each end, we can note that the longitudinal design is always critical if we have a circular pier or if we have a square pier. If they're elongated so that they have different strengths in longitudinal and transverse directions, then this assumption doesn't uh, apply or this conclusion doesn't. So here we've analyzed different types of structures. Here you see a very regular structure, uniform height piers. This is a um, slightly more irregular with a taller central pier. The, the numbers refer to the relative height. So here they're all the same. Here this second one is twice this height here. And the third case, this is one and these outer ones are twice as tall. And what's been done here is looking at different proportions of the total superstructure shear that is carried, that's the ratio that's carried by superstructure, which is an expression of the relative stiffness of the superstructure and the substructure, we can determine what the ratio of the design force for the columns are, or the critical column, as a fraction of the longitudinal response. And you see that in all cases, the transverse shear divided by the longitudinal shear is less than one. So that's rather nice if you've got a regular structure, you can forget about the longitudinal response and just do the, sorry, you can forget about the transverse response and just do the longitudinal response. Finally, some considerations on capacity design considerations for bridges. Um, first of all, just uh, some consideration of what we are doing. Essentially, the, the basic requirement is that the is that the uh, strength of a capacity protected element, such as the bridge pier itself or shear, its dependable strength must exceed the required strength here. And that required strength is the strength that comes from the displacement based design multiplied by a dynamic amplification factor, if important, and also by an overstrength factor. And you notice that in this case we do use a strength reduction factor. And this is because we do have the possibility of a brittle failure if we're talking about shear failure. So we make sure that we have a dependable shear strength which exceeds the maximum feasible shear demand. Um, actual strength developed in earthquakes. We've mentioned that the best way to do this is in fact to do moment curvature analysis using the overstrength material properties. And what this slide shows is for a particular bridge pier, three different or four different moment curvature responses. This value here is the value that would be used for design in displacement-based design using probable material strengths, including the effects of confinement and including the effects of strain hardening. This value down here is what we would do with conventional force-based design 
but not including the strength reduction factor. So this doesn't include strain hardening and doesn't include force-based design. So you can see that, sorry, it doesn't include a strength reduction factor, it doesn't include strain hardening or confinement. And you can see that even with those differences, there's quite a big difference and advantage that you get in the displacement-based design by the lack of conservatism. If we then do an overstrength analysis using the maximum material strength itself, then you can see that we get an overstrength ratio, which is the, the ratio of this value to this value for design, perhaps 20%, 1.2, whereas if we use this value here, the force-based design, we are having to build in a much greater margin and capacity between the force-based design and the shear design for the system itself. Looking at uh, the degree of fixity at the pier top, no, I'll skip through that and just show it here. When we're talking about the design of a simple bridge pier, they're always a little bit more complex than we assume. For example, if we have a wide superstructure, then there is some rotational inertia associated with the response there, which means that we have a two-mass system. And though in design, we assume that the moment profile is zero at the point of contra at the center of the mass of the superstructure, increasing to a maximum at the base, the in rotational inertia of the superstructure may mean that the point of contraflexure is above the top of the pier or below. So, and particularly below is more common. So there may be zero moment at some distance down the column itself due to the restraint to displacement and rotation of the, of the distributed mass of the superstructure. And even when we take into account the enhancement of moment capacity at the base due to material strengths exceeding the specified values, we also have to take into account the reduced height associated with this higher mode. And that means that we would calculate the uh, overstrength shear as this overstrength moment divided by this overstrength effective height as shown there. So just simple things that need to be considered. Longitudinal seismic response is straightforward. We just amplify the moments in the usual fashion. But the transverse response is a little different and the same for the abutments. Here, the critical thing is what is the maximum response of the superstructure transversely? And the maximum response of that, the superstructure transversely, will be when the piers are weaker than we anticipated, not when they're stronger. If the piers are stronger, they're going to reduce the displacement of the superstructure and therefore the moments in the superstructure and the forces in the abutments. So the critical capacity design for the superstructure and the abutments is when we use a minimum reasonable strength for the piers. And we would therefore attribute slightly more shear to the, um, uh, to the superstructure itself. And we provide guidance in, uh, so that you don't have to do a specific uh, analysis of this. Now, just to show how these higher mode effects uh, look in a sort of real structure, this you can see is a fairly, it's a six span bridge uh, with some irregularity associated with it. The heights, relative heights are three, two, one, one, two. So it's, it's fairly irregular and it has been designed by displacement based design with the predicted profile transversely being this black design as is shown here. The displacement profile that we have from the time history analysis that we use to verify this agrees pretty well. It's not so good in this region here, but these are not critical in comparison with the two central, these column here and this column here is where we're really concerned because they're the shorter columns here and they have the largest uh, displacements associated with them. However, when we look at the moments in the superstructure, here are the moments in the superstructure from the force base, sorry, from the displacement based design, that's the single mode simulation, but the time history results are shown by this line here. Damn, there we go again. 
And you can see that there's now quite considerable difference. And particularly, there's a difference in the moments at this location here and to a lesser extent here. Well, we might say it doesn't really matter because the superstructure moments, the maxima value is predicted well by the displacement-based approach. But the important thing is that the abutment reactions are the shear in this end span, so they're the slope of that diagram. And you can see that the shear that comes out from the single mode analysis is way below what the actual value is. So we need to have some means of predicting this with some uh, greater accuracy. And of course, we could do the time history analysis. I, I have recommended that this is a good approach to take. Um, but we could also use a modal analysis based on the effective stiffness at maximum response of these peers. And we call that effective modal, uh, modal structural analysis. And you can see that that gives a pretty good agreement with the time history analysis. So you do a modal analysis where it's an elastic analysis, but instead of using the elastic stiffness, we would use the effective stiffness at maximum displacement response of these peers, together with the elastic stiffness of the superstructure, and use that to predict it. And under those circumstances, modal analysis is not a bad procedure. I think we can skip through that. The final one in this thing is just to emphasize the difference between uh, force-based design and displacement-based design. Again, looking at this simple structure and a longitudinal response. In force-based design, we start from the estimate of what the stiffness is, and we say that that's proportional to the inverse of the height cubed of the, of the columns itself. And therefore, the shear force is distributed to the columns in that same proportion to their stiffness. The moments will be in proportion to the shear force times the height, which means that they're in proportion to the inverse of the height squared. And approximately, the reinforcement ends up in the same proportion itself. And this is done on the assumption that the ductility demand can be made to be the same by adjusting these strengths. Now, we've mentioned that that is impossible. The yield curvature for these columns, if they have the same dimensions, will be the same. So the yield displacements will be proportional to the height squared. And this is expressed here. We have the same design displacement, but the yield displacement of this tall pier is very small. This one here is, is, sorry, is very large, and this one is very small. So we have different ductilities and different displacements at yield, which is not recognized in this approach at all. In displacement-based design, we start from the assumption or from a knowledge that the ductility is going to be proportional to the inverse of the height squared, because we know that the displacements here are constant, and we know that the yield displacements are proportional to the height squared itself. We then make the assumption, it's not an assumption, we make the design decision that the reinforcement is going to be the same in the columns. If we know that that's the case, then we know that the moments are the same in each column, and we know that the shear force is inversely proportional to the height, and that the effective stiffnesses of the columns are inverse proportion to the height. Perhaps the most significant thing here is the difference between this, in the stiffness, one over height cube, one over height, but also that the design process is completely the opposite way. Here we start from this point and proceed in this direction to come up with the wrong answer. Here we start from here and proceed in the opposite direction to come up with a correct answer. Okay.